their local book. Thank you. Thanks for doing that, Cheryl, probably. Um, we also are going to have our lovely IDs, Cheryl and Sean. They'll be presenting uh, some norming topics for us. Uh, highlighting and clarifying some of the sections of the rubric. So I'm sure we'll all find that very helpful. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up with some reminders and some tips for moving forward with our with your uh, poker team, uh, things that you can do. Um, I do have, uh, we do have um, this Google Sheet, which, which I will share right now. Um, so I am dropping this link in the chat. There it goes. Hopefully you can all access that. You should be able to access that. Um, so that is, um, that's just like our, our way of uh, keeping attendance for today's norming session. So if you can just go ahead and find your college and add your name, and I think it's just your name and email. So if you can do that, um, and if anybody has any trouble, just let me know. But I think you should all be able to access that just fine. Um, all right. Um, if someone from your poker team is unable to attend, or if you just want to view this session again, or a past session, all of our sessions are recorded um, and you can find all of the recordings in our poker re, uh, on our poker resource center homepage. And I'll go ahead and drop the link for that. Let me see. I have it ready right here. So that will take you that link will take you to our uh, resource center with um, the recordings and just a bunch of other information that you, I'm sure, have all seen. Okay, so moving on to announcements. Um, Bob, I don't know if you want to take this or if you want me to continue. I'm good either way. Uh, please continue. You're doing great. All right, excellent. All right, so we do have some announcements for next year. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have any new news to share with you guys. Um, as you can see in the slide, um, we, you know, we don't have a, a whole lot of inf a new, new information to share with you um, as far as at one in the local poker uh, process. However, CVC and the Chancellor's Office are committed to continuing uh, the work that we have been doing. And uh, all of you that are here on this call, um, and in this meeting, you all share with me and we all share uh, the understanding and, and the, the love for what we do and for the cause. Um, so um, I, I know we all we all feel the same. Um, but uh, we do know that the CVC and the Chancellor's Office are working together on a new grant and scope for At One. So hopefully we'll have some news in the very near future, uh, but no news today. Uh, CVC and the Chancellor's Office are also committed to continuing the local poker program into the next year. Uh, any college that's in progress for local poker certification will continue to receive support. And any questions that you may have um, can be directed to Marina Amini. Um, so that is the updates that uh, we have so far. Um, not as I mentioned right now, not a whole lot of new news, um, but there is, um, you know, a lot of talk of commitment and of understanding of the work that we do. Um, and again, if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to Marina. Um, is everybody okay on the chat? I'm just making sure I think somebody needs that. Google Sheet shared again. Oh, thank you, Bob. Um, all right, am I good to go on? I think I am good. All right, so some um, some information, some stats. 
Um, so our wonderful IDs, along with all of you guys here, have been working really hard to receive local poker certification. So, so far we have 49 uh, colleges that have gotten, have received local poker certification. Uh, we have 1,346 courses that are aligned with a quality review badge in the CVC exchange. And um, I know that the IDs, myself and many other colleges are still working really hard to continue to get their local poker certification. So we do have a few colleges that are currently in the process. And that's what the previous slide kind of mentioned that those colleges will continue to be supported um, uh, throughout the process. Okay, I'm seeing that there's issues with the Google uh, Doc. Is, has anybody been able to do anything with it? Let's see. Um, I see a, uh, Jane from Antelope. Oh, no, there are a few people. Okay, so it seems to be working for some. Okay. So if, if you're having trouble, um, it, it is, it should be accessible to everyone. Um, so hopefully, hopefully it'll work for everyone. All right, so those are our stats for poker. Um, so, um, you know, the hope is that we continue on and that we continue to get um, as many colleges certified as possible. And um, as I said earlier, you know, there is a commitment to continue with this work. Um, and I, I, I'm preaching to the choir in this group when I say that we know how important this work is and we know how powerful poker is. Um, all right, so it's, I am way ahead of schedule. Um, but since uh, I think we have everyone here, um, I think um, I have, I, I'm not sure, Jackie, if you're presenting, uh, I think you mentioned somebody else maybe presenting, um, but um, I Maggie. Maggie is, I just made her co-host. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. All right. So we have our first, oh, and I, I guess I should stop um, sharing, right? I think we're good. <laughs> oh, we're good. I've already stopped sharing. Thank you. All right. So we have Maggie from Santa Ana College that's going to talk about their poker process. So go ahead, Maggie. Okay. Um, actually, it's Jackie. Uh, oh, sorry, Jackie. It's all right. It's all right. Um, Maggie is going to be, she's one of my amazing, she's the instructional designer um, with our team, and she's going to be helping me. She's doing the slides for me, so I don't have to uh, pay attention to more than one thing. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, my name is Jackie King. Uh, for the past year, I've been the poker lead at Santa Ana College. And starting in the fall, I'll be the um, distance education faculty coordinator for Santa Ana College. Um, but before that, I, I have to give so much uh, credit to our process and um, to, to Shirley Kushida, who just uh, retired um, this month. <laughs> uh, so, um, that's that's basically what I wanted to say. I have an amazing team, and so many of you all are here today. So, okay, uh, just a quick uh, update for our timeline. We've been uh, local poker certified for quite some time now. We became a teaching college in the fall of 2022, um, and we currently have 97 quality badged uh, courses. Um, we have two currently in our local uh, poker review process. Uh, one should be, one of those should be added um, to getting reviewed just either today or tomorrow. Um, and we have 57 in progress that are working with, um, with our ID, with uh, Maggie and our accessibility clerk. Uh, we have two of those that are remote instruction elements. So we're really trying to uh, take those as kind of uh, best practices in our other fully remote uh, courses that are being added. And we also have our first non-credit course in the process and should be um, uh, quality badged very quickly. And that instructor is actually uh, here with us today. And uh, OK, we can go to the next slide. So this is the, the team right now that we have. We have myself, um, Maggie Manzano, and Amber, who's our accessibility clerk. 
and um, we meet once a week and go over our whole uh, process, who we are, should be talking to. Um, and I do see in this chat that Sarah Hawkins uh, remote instruction. Yes, it's fully online course. Yes, no, no face to face meetings. So um, this is the this is the big uh, slide we have here. So this is our process. Um, the main thing that we start with is our actual um, online training certification that all of our faculty have to go through um, in order to teach online. Um, our course that they go through is aligned with At One's online teaching and design. It takes the same amount of hours as as theirs do. Um, and we utilize the OEI course design rubric to certify our faculty. So all of our faculty before they even teach online are at least familiar with the rubric. They are uh, utilizing it. And that's how we, we fill out the, the rubric for them in order to be certified. So they have to be aligned in all of those areas in order to teach online. Um, and then the other thing we do is that we meet uh, weekly, our team does, and we since we have so many courses now that are certified, we really strategize um, regarding which courses to badge. Um, this last uh, year, we have been focusing more on career and technical ed pathways. So um, certain degrees or certificates that maybe have some gaps in courses that are not certified as a, a quality badged. And so we want to make sure that the entire degree can be completed online and with a quality course. And so we're really targeting kind of going to those uh, individuals, those faculty members, and seeing if they'd be interested in getting um, their course certified. Uh, we also do quite, quite a few professional development workshops, not only during um, the flex week that happens at the beginning of semesters, but uh, the DE office uh, provides a lot of them throughout the semester as well. Uh, we do general outreach to our uh, deans and chairs just, just to make sure they're always aware of what's going on. Um, but the thing we're working on now is more targeted communication to specific faculty. Um, once they have decided that this is something that is interesting to them, that they would like to, um, we introduce them to the, the, the team essentially, so they can work with um, Amber and Maggie and um, once, and we don't set a deadline on these things. That's one big thing that uh, works really well in their favor. We, we don't tell them it has to be completed within um, a, a year or one semester. It's like, when you have the time, please work with us. You know, if you want to, us to give you a deadline, if that works better for you, we can do that. But um, we wanna make sure that there's nothing, we're not, we're not gonna be like, uh, demanding that they finish all of this on a certain timeline. Um, but once they have completed and we feel like it's uh, at a place where it can go to our local poker reviewers, we um, randomly assign uh, two poker reviewers uh, to look at the course. We have 11 credit and six non-credit reviewers on our team. Um, and once we get those back, I typically give, um, we typically give our reviewers about two to three weeks to complete that review. Always depends if it's the end of the semester, you know, maybe a little bit more time. Uh, once we get that review back, um, we we look at any in, any incompletes, um, adjust based on that, and then the ID does the final quality review, and we submit for badges. Um, I see Carol has a question about how we convince faculty to go through this process. Um, and a, a lot of it is just being able to see, we're, we're getting a lot of our faculty are seeing that many students want an online course and they really like the, it's actually not that difficult to convince them that this is a good thing for enrollment and or just to improve their course, especially since our, our team has such just amazing um, confidence in our, in our campus, like they know that they get to work with this team and having the accessibility clerk to go through and make sure and help them with like captions to help them with documents is a big, uh, big sell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the other um, part that I think is incredibly helpful for our faculty is that we have a template 
that automatically gets added into every class, even in-person classes, remote classes. This is the core of their uh, Canvas shell is um, set up already to be aligned for many of the items in the OEI, uh, OEI course design rubric. Um, the homepage is consistent across all of our students' classes. Um, there is a resources module that gets added into every class that has all of the student services and technical training that then faculty can link to in multiple places. There's also a communication plan, netiquette, uh, course policies. We have all of these pages kind of set up um, with headings and with instructions on how they can add their own information into this. Uh, we also set up some uh, template announcements for them as well. So I really feel that this is incredibly helpful to just kind of give a baseline to all faculty to have some things that match up uh, to the OEI course design rubric. And this is the other thing, I didn't want to mention it early, but we are actually able to pay our faculty for this work. And I think that is also a, <laughs> a way that we can um, make sure that they are able to, uh, or wanting to, and feel appreciated um, for um, the work that they do. We have different funding sources. We have a OER and ZTC funding source, and then we have strong workforce funds that we get uh, every year uh, for CTE courses specifically. And then we have general funds for classes that fall outside of the CTE or an OER grant. Um, and they're paid at different rates for this. So if it is a course that has not been uh, uh, quality badged yet, and it is an, a new instructor, we are able to pay them if it's a general funds, if it's a course that is not CTE, we are able to give them $1,000 to do this work. If it is a, a CTE course, occasionally we have extra funds, so we try to give them more. Uh, we're, I think sometimes we have 3,000, sometimes it's 1,000. If they are also working to make their class uh, OER, ZTC, we are able to pay them an extra $1,000 for that. Um, but then what we have is, some, w as soon as an instructor finishes their course and it's quality badged, we ask them if, they, if they'd be okay with making their course a starter course. So kind of a template course that uh, if they're okay with it, other faculty that are going to be teaching that same course can kind of adopt and have a uh, they don't have to start from scratch. They'll essentially have a course that has the majority of the aligned materials within it. And so we're able to pay them. We pay them a little less for that because they're not doing the groundwork on that. And then we also are able to pay our, our poker reviewers for six reviews a semester. So um, between um, making sure that our poker reviewers are paid for the work that they are doing and the um, just making sure that many, many of our faculty um, feel really weird about getting paid up front. <laughs> like they want to make sure that they've done the work before they get paid, but unfortunately it doesn't really work with uh, our budget or the uh, fiscal year. So sometimes we just have to really convince them that we trust you and you're able to get paid for this. Um, and occasionally some of them just want to do it as professional development and don't want to get paid. Um, that's, that's a little less than, than the ones that would like to get paid after. But uh, fortunately, we are able to um, uh, pay our faculty for this. So we're very lucky in that regard. Um, and if they, if they are, I see a question about someone else getting a stipend if they use a start, starter course. And yes, we, it's like $500 that we give a, a faculty member if they use a starter course as opposed to building their own. Right. Um, just before I go in, we do have uh, a, a, a prep sheet. This uh, We actually modified this from Long Beach City College when they um, did their presentation. Um, so this is what the ID uh, Maggie works on with the faculty. Each of these links go to um, the OEI course rubric. And um, we also, Maggie made a version of the poker examples course for ours that includes our template and things that we use. So uh, that links goes to that self-enroll link and each of the rubric items goes to where that is in the poker example course. 
um, so that they can add anything, any questions they might have. And we also have a, a collaborative document that the three of us use to keep track of everything and if we have any questions. Oh, great. all right, so now I can answer any questions that anyone might have. I, I do see a few in the chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to help you, Jackie. Thank, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that uh, information. A lot of us are very jealous right now yeah, of, <laughs> of uh, where you're at and how, how far uh, your college has come. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, let me see. I know that Maggie has done well in answering <laughs> that. Oh, they're asking about the accessibility clerk. What is the job title of the accessibility clerk? believe Maggie, I don't want to say the wrong oh. thing. So right now she's just one of our clerks that's been doing accessibility for us. And mm -hmm. we're currently working on getting her reclassed as a um, DESS, which is our distance ed services specialist, um, because that covers a lot of the work that she's been doing. And um, I know there was a question. I've been trying to type and do the slides at the same time. Um, she is full time at that so and 95 percent of her time is spent on accessibility for our oei courses yeah. very nice uh somebody's asking sylvia's asking about blueprints do you use blueprints to add the student resources module oh when we load the template i assume we, that's what she means yeah so. we we don't um the template is automatically in the courses um, and then faculty, when they get their sandbox, they import their course content into it. Um, and then we are offering flex credit because we just updated the template. Um, so anytime anyone copies over a new course um, to get them to adopt the new template and the new resources, we're offering, um, I believe it's two hours of flex for every course that they're doing um, so that they can kind of get encouraged to continue to use the new template. Okay, thank you. And Sylvia, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to do a follow up on that. So thanks for clarifying that. So um, yeah, that's a difficulty we have is when the template gets updated, and mm -hmm. especially the student resources. Um, so you're offering flex credit, how often do you make changes to the student resources content? Um, this is the first time in a while we've done a like major change. Um, mm -hmm. But when we do our um, PD sessions, we usually um, have one on how to copy your course over and ensure that you're using the resources module that's still in there. So most of our faculty are used to the idea of kind of bringing back in the new resources module um, because we offer we have our template on um, Commons as well. So whenever there's a big change is really when we offer the flex credit for the the template um, and then for general we just kind of encourage and hope for the best on that one <laughs> we only try to make changes once a year yeah okay so they're bringing in the entire module like from comments yeah okay that's good thank you thank you and then um just to follow up on the question you you said that the um de advisory group is the one that um approved that template course, and then um, no Senate approval at your college was needed for that template course to be used across. I believe there was, but that was back. That was done back in, I believe, like twenty seventeen or so. Yeah. Um, we've had a template for quite a long time. Okay. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and then is the starter course open access for us to view? Sarah Pierce would like to know. Um, know. It's all up to the instructor. Um, so the instructor has it open. If they've said, yes, this is available, it's available for like people in their department. Um, any of our, I mean, any of our faculty that go through that can always put stuff up in the, in the comments if they'd like that, but we're not, at the moment, we're not doing that. So we're not putting it up for everyone okay. at the moment. And then I, we, there's, we, you covered the stipends. Thank you for sharing that. That was very helpful. Uh, I do see somebody asking the poker 
poker reviewers are paid $1,200 for their six reviews. Okay. Um, I don't know which budget. <laughs> I think it's the general fund. Jackie, Sarah had a question. It's the mm -hmm. instructors who use the templates are paid at half the rate, question mark. Yes. Yeah, so if if they're adopting a course that's already been aligned and so they're using that as the template, um, we're able to give them five hundred dollars for the work. Great. And then the instructors who are authoring the course. Yes. Um, are they just paid one time? Yes, they're paid one time. OK. And then how many templates do you have? I'm sorry if you said that. I love um, this. Idea. How many how many starter courses do we? Yeah, have? starter courses. Yes. Ooh, I didn't I didn't grab that information. You have a a, um, a good bucket of courses for folks to pull from. We do like. quite a bit, actually. I believe out of the ninety seven, I'm gonna say like half half of them have agreed to be starter courses. That's awesome. Yeah, that's it, so great. I love this idea. <laughs> Thank you so it really, much. It even helps just for like, even for faculty who are not going through the OEI process, uh, we get faculty requests saying, hey, I have this new adjunct, can they please use my starter course, just so that they have a course that is like aligned and quality, even though they're not going through the OEI process. Right. Thank Back you, so you, solved, you solved the whole problem of master course or model course, starter <laughs> course is such well, a good I didn't name. solve that. <laughs> so it's such a good name. We have, um, we have 48 starter 48. courses. Nice. So yeah, it was, it's like half. <laughs> uh, and then Sean is wondering, do your reviewers review sections A through D? They review A through D all the way through, yes. And then um, how long does it take each reviewer to review each course? Um, that is, we have some that do it the next day after I give it to them. And there's others that take a little bit longer. Um, I We kind of know uh, our reviewers style. So I typically will choose one that I know focuses, you know, really heavily on accessibility. And I'll choose another one that's really focused on design so that uh, we get a good um, mingling of, of everybody's skill set. But typically we, we ask for like two weeks. Okay. And then uh, Sarah is asking, is the Excel sheet shown uh, that had the links to that CVC course design resources shareable? Uh, uh, we actually thought about that, I believe. Maggie, uh, the one we have isn't shareable. Most of the links won't work for y'all because it's uh, linked to our internal uh, courses. However, uh, yes, we can send something out that is, um, that is modifiable, ed editable. That would be great. And um, I, I think that's all the questions that we have. Jackie, okay. I want to thank you and Maggie. Oh, wait. How is the instructional designer used uh, in your process? Maggie, how are you used? <laughs> <laughs> um, so usually what I do is I'll meet with faculty at the beginning and we'll kind of go through um their course and do kind of a quick look I'll walk them through um the rubric and kind of what we're looking for um I do a review of the first couple modules um just to get an idea of what each of the the pieces look like and I'll give them recommendations on how they can meet the areas kind of what areas really need um to be focused on usually it's like instructions um those kinds of sections and I'll fill out that sheet um, and send them the link. And I'll also link in Amber um, so that she can start on her accessibility review. And then faculty goes and works on it. And then I come back and I'll do a full course review and kind of keep reviewing until we are ready for um, the poker reviews. And then I do a double check at the very end. Thanks, Maggie. And Bob, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to circle back, Jackie, to how you select faculty mm -hmm. for the or recruit, encourage faculty into the process. You mentioned a strategic way you're looking at programs to try to badge key courses in an entire program that's very interesting. 
Um, any other strategies? Are you mostly trying to recruit or do they come to you? How does that work? Um, we do have some that come to us. Um, I typically, like just, I got an email uh, yesterday about uh, a communication studies course that wants to go through the process. Uh, there's a lot of word of mouth that goes on. Um, and so that happens totally. But as far as the, the more targeted recruiting, um, this last semester, like Maggie went through all of our CTE degrees and found a few courses that are in multiple degrees. And we we're like, we don't have any of these courses badged and they would, they would assist in multiple degrees and certification. So we reached out to their we reached out to the individual faculty. Some of them were adjunct and they also reached out to like their chairs and just like let them know that this is happening. There, some of our chairs are very concerned about their adjuncts. And so we wanted to make sure that like we're paying them for their time and they're, they can do this whenever they have the opportunity. Um, we didn't wanna put any extra, um, extra work on them essentially and only be done during the time that works for them. We actually do have quite a bit doing working over the summer. So that's another uh, kind of key piece is like asking faculty at the beginning of fall semester to do this is typically, I don't even try that typically. Uh, it won't really work, but um, if I reach out at the end of fall semester or the end of spring, then they typically think that they have some extra time, even if they maybe don't. What, what's interesting and shareable with this idea, Jackie, is you're starting to use local poker badging as an enrollment management tool. Yes. And if you target, say, GE courses that are in multiple programs, getting them badged higher up in a student search in the CBC exchange, this can bring you uh, more enrollments, serve more students. So uh, well done. Yeah. Uh, I also saw a question here. I'm not sure you addressed. Someone asked if you have published a, a list of the, the the rates you pay faculty for the various roles of both reviewers and faculty member, faculty authors. Is that available for you to share or do you? Um, I don't have anything like that, but I can share that. We can add that to the slides that we share out if that would be helpful. Uh, I think it would, thank you. Okay. All right. Then thank you so much, Jackie and Maggie, for presenting. Uh, there's lots of thanks um, in the chat. Um, everyone's so happy to have been here to hear this. Um, and th this has been very inspirational. I do want to give a shout out to um, to Helen for that wonderful course that she created. And I saw that Cheryl mentioned in the chat that course will live on and on and it will, it will Helen live on and on. I, I know that lots of us uh, do refer to that course. Uh, Jackie and Maggie have uh, kind of re uh, done that course for themselves, you know, in that Excel spreadsheet. And um, I know I use it in my college, all at my college all the time. So uh, Helen, thank you so much for putting that together. Um, and Sarah Pierce is asking which course. I'll drop it into the uh, chat in just a little bit. Um, it's the I don't remember what the number is, but it's the it, it's it's the key that holds um, an explanation of every section of oh thank you Cheryl of the um, of the rubric with the great examples. Um, thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, the course design. Uh, resources course. All right. Well, thank you once again so much, Jackie and Maggie. I am so happy that you guys were able to make time for us. Uh, next, we have another wonderful presentation from Janet Williams from North Orange County Continuing Education. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, that was a, a great uh, presentation. Thank you, Santa Anna college. Um, I was kind of making notes because our process is very similar. Um, we are using our instructional designer to do an intake uh, orientation process just to help faculty think through what they need to do on the front end to make it more expedient for our reviewers. Um, we're actually using the worksheet from the local poker resources website. So thank you at one team. I'm all about uh, reusing, recycling, remixing. That was awesome. So we're using that same worksheet, which I think is also going to be helpful for our adjunct faculty who work at multiple institutions. 
So they're seeing the same resources at multiple places. That's the hope. Now, full disclosure, we're just getting ready to kick off in the fall. We just received our um, certification back in the spring, so we're ready to hit it hard in the fall. Um, we have outsourced all of our training to at one, so we do require our faculty in order to be DE certified to go through the online teaching and design uh, program or 12 week certification course. Um, so shameless uh, plug with Dr. Amini, please, please make sure we have those <laughs> a lot of sections. Um, otherwise we have to rethink everything. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just gonna beg at this point. Um, so we have our faculty go through that course. We have tied poker to our recertification process. So we, rather than just have them doing professional development, we want to, we want them to go through the poker process because we know it's good for students. We, we're all aware that that consistency, that um, thoughtfulness is very helpful to students. Um, like Santa Ana, we are going to target the most high, uh, highly demanded courses and courses where we can put the full certificate online. Um, we are all non-credit, so we've got a little bit different focus than maybe some of our um, credit colleagues in terms of how we define um, demand. And that's been a little bit of a, actually it's been a huge learning curve for us as well. Um, from there, um, I started trying to think through how can we really support this. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of my background and I'm going to completely date myself. So when I first started teaching Dinosaurs Run the Earth and um, the uh, master's degree I received was in cross-cultural education, which is working with second language learners. And then um, now, you know, the, we call it UDL. So that's uh, to let you know solidly in Gen X. So when I started as our DE coordinator, using all the resources from At One, I was a one-woman show for almost three years, and I knew we needed instructional design support, so I doubled back and went through um, another master's program that focused on instructional design and online program administration. And the only reason I'm sharing that is because that completely changed the lens through which I view this process. And when I started as DE coordinator, everything was through the lens of how do we get it online? How do we make it look good? How do we make it accessible for students? And I have come to realize that with that focus, we're, we're still creating a lot of, of unnecessary, in my opinion, work. So I am going to, I don't have a lot of slides, so I apologize. So, I completely agree with this um, from our, can everyone see my screen now? This is the, the, the frame, the framework that I started with, like most of you guys, where we spend 90% of our time on the, uh, the competency areas. Since I started rethinking this and realizing that, okay, maybe if we focus on those online things, we're still gonna have quite a few gaps in the process. So with all due respect to whomever created this infographic, I've, I've had to wrap my head around it in this regard. Um, we are actually trying to spend the majority of our time on the curriculum development, the course alignment and mapping, and the content development before we even go to the curriculum approval process. And several reasons for that. If it, well, we're all familiar with sections one and sections C. When we went through the alignment process with our model courses, we realized we had a lot of course rewriting to do. Um, in a couple of cases, uh, we had to tweak the SLOs to make sure we were really aligned with the program outcome tweaking the instructional objectives so that those align with that, and then helping faculty rethink their assessments to ensure that we are actually measuring what we say we're going to do with the course or the program. All of those things necessitated us submitting our model courses back through the curriculum approval process. So in my wild and crazy dreams, this will become a parallel path. Every time we revise a course, Every time we develop a new course, we're actually thinking, 
from the very beginning, what is that alignment piece? How does that work? And then in terms of curriculum approval, it becomes much easier. And in terms of the online course poker uh, development, or I'm sorry, online poker approval, then that should breeze right through. Um, so that's where we kind of took a little bit walk on the wild side. Um, I became so fascinated with this uh, process. I'm now kind of looking at the barriers to this front end piece um, for a dissertation. And coming from a K-12 background, I know I take a little bit different spin. So our challenge at NOCE is going to be expanding the understanding that instructional design is not just online courses. And when I started as DE coordinator, I had that exact same mindset. So we're having, we're having to shift a, a lot of that thinking, oh, wait a minute, it's not just because your course is online. We need to be looking at what assessments are you using in face-to-face -face courses. So we have comparable data, no matter what modality we're teaching in. That's going to require us to do a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure building, a lot of buy-in from faculty. I feel pretty comfortable this group that's gathered. I've heard academic freedom more in the last six months than I have in the last 20 a lot years in education. So developing that fundamental understanding that it's, it's not a difference of academic freedom, that I respect where you're coming from as your discipline, uh, being a, a subject matter expert in your discipline, but instructional design is a completely different science and we have to be okay with that. It's not one or the other. I've had several very interesting conversations with very engaged faculty all about online instruction. And it still comes around to no one's going to tell me how to teach my course. And I've had to approach it. What if I could help you take everything you know about your, your discipline and put it in a package that students understand it. It's going to save you time on answering emails, text over the weekend when you have an assessment, your outcomes will be better, your, your persistence will be better. That sounds great. Guess what? That's what we're doing. <laughs> so building that um, capacity within our own faculty, within our faculty leaders, we're having to rethink um, how the process of SLO management works, how the process of DE works in terms of an advisory group, our, our curriculum approval process. Because when you start think of, thinking of it from a systems perspective, the Venn diagram is basically an overlapping circle. And that's where the big mind shift is, is happening for us. Now, I am trying to now rethink some of these concepts because we developed a, a poker support course. We differed a little bit from Santa Ana in that I linked out to the at one course because I didn't want to miss any updates and I can only keep an eye on so many different canvas shells at once. So we linked out so we'll be able to catch any updates there. But I do want to now front load some of these instructional design concepts for our faculty before they even meet with our ID. The other thing that we're going to have to do with our faculty is make sure they understand as we make these changes for the online course, that's going to impact the course outline of record, which means you need to go see our curriculum chair as well, because we can't change what we're doing online without changing what we do everywhere else. Um, a resource that I am still finalizing uh, for our faculty, and um, I, I was very fortunate that a lot of what I was doing for homework became very, very helpful um, for what I'm doing with our faculty. Course mapping was a new concept for me in terms of the, the front loading. We had a really steep learning curve in working with uh, Ease Learning and putting some courses on the Skillways platform, um, which by the way is awesome, that's a separate presentation, but looking at this um, on the front end. So this is a spreadsheet that I put together for our faculty. Um, the um, institutional outcomes are there, uh, asking faculty to look at program outcomes, then the SLOs for their individual course, and then this basically walks them through that backwards design piece that's introduced in uh, the at one course. 
So I've set it up so the chunking is done, identifying the instructional objectives, encouraging faculty to use Bloom's taxonomy, and then figuring out what, how they're going to assess, what those assessments look like. Is it formative or summative? Are we scaffolding the learning and circling back enough to, to provide support? What are the rubric criteria? Do students know how they're going to be assessed and on what? And then looking at instructional materials. This is another interesting conversation that's been on repeat where when I talk about uh, instructional materials with faculty, it always circles back to a textbook. And then the textbook drives everything else. So as we move more toward OER and zero textbook costs, we really have to think about how are we uh, parsing out those individual pieces to support the assessments, which support the IOs, which support the SLOs. Um, then from that point, actually going through what are the instructional activities and the strategies, um, having faculty think through how are they getting in all the RSI pieces. And I love spreadsheets, so I have set this up so faculty can put in a number for their in-class hours, their out-of-class hours, and it will total for them. So per module, they have an estimated time on task. And then at the end of the spreadsheet, it totals. So they have the instructional hours all added up before they go to the curriculum committee. And again, non-credit with its um, attendance accounting is a little bit different. So we do need to know as accurately as possible how many in, how many out, because it drastically affects our funding. So as I roll this out, um, I will definitely keep everyone posted. I have the course orientation and template, which I can show you guys very quickly. We use the City Labs Design Plus, which is worth every penny and more. And this is multiple iterations. Um, looking at how faculty were using my first version and what was in demand and what were they asking for. Instead of creating um, a template for enough modules to get them through the semester, I instead created one and I'm teaching faculty how to clone it. With um, City Labs, it's super easy to do tabs. So I gave faculty an option with horizontal tabs with the accordion vertical um, accessible tables. So I tried to build in as many different pieces as I thought they would use. And then again, uh, showing them how to just clone it for as many as they need. I'm a huge fan of the Quick Check template in Design Plus. For those of you who are not familiar with it, you can, um, obviously you build your content the way you normally would. Um, put in your question and then answers. You can add different fields. So it could be true, false, multiple choice. What's cool about this uh, template is you can set it so the student can't click next. That button is hidden until they get the answer right. So this becomes a very quick, ungraded, formative assessment. So again, most of this is theoretical, but we didn't have an online program when the shutdown orders were issued. So this, again, has been a very, very steep learning curve, trial by fire, um, and then trying to get all the various pieces, rope them in, and make it as, as systematic as possible for our faculty as we launch. Um, let's see. I thought I saw a question. Uh, Janet, I think somebody, well, not just somebody, many of us would like to know if you will be willing to share that wonderful document with us. Um, the one where you have outlined like the PLOs, the SLOs. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Oh, one other thing I built into um, our orientation module, I built a student prep course, which it was self-paced. It takes students through how to navigate court, uh, Canvas, what are the NOCE's online student resources, how do you contact them, what do they do, um, and then it issues a badge. So we've been having pretty good luck with that. 
I set up the orientation module so faculty have a choice how they use it. They can make it extra credit. They can make it an ungraded assignment. They can make it a required assignment. Um, but what we realized is our students want and need a little bit more personal touch. We need to go more in depth. I had requests from faculty for more information on academic integrity. And so my next iteration on that is going to make it a facilitated course that uh, would open up two weeks before the term and we can put it as an advisory or a co-rec to allow students to do before they start their first online course. And bonus points, it allows us to collect FTE. Um, so that was a lot of information. I know it feels like I was all over the map, but quick plug, um, this was a preview of the three individual sessions I'll be doing in a couple of weeks at OTC. So um, if you want more information, come to any one of the three. Excellent. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. I think um, there, there was just comments of wonderful and everybody likes City Labs. Uh, any questions? Oh, Bob, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, Janet. Thank you for this. This may bring up a, a larger question from you about non-credit courses in the exchange. And uh, you'll see now there are not many of them. We don't encourage it at present uh, for a number of reasons. That doesn't mean you shouldn't badge these courses because a, an aligned course is a higher quality course and you'll get better student outcomes and uh, student satisfaction and persistence. But um, there are some fundamental uh, things about non-credit that make it difficult for our exchange. Our exchange, exchange was designed for the transfer, the immediate enrollment of uh, transferable courses to complete credit programs. Um, it is not usually the case where you can transfer a non-credit course into another college's program. Uh, so there's that. Also, most colleges to our knowledge um, don't have their non-credit students go through CCC Apply, which is a key element of our exchange uh, transfer data. Um, However, uh, again, you, you will find some online non-credit courses in the exchange now. It, that's up to the college if they want to put them in there. Um, but when a student goes into a search, uh, we certainly don't want them to land on that page and see zero registration and think, oh, this is good. I'll take this course. But uh, all the, the usual rules apply. They need to check with their counselors to make sure these courses are transferable. and Most of them are not. So. We do have uh, plans in a probably uh, a year from now to begin um, creating a, a more of a workflow for non-credit students in our exchange, but uh, that work will happen after we get all the credit processes in place for, we hope, all 115 colleges. So I just wanted to add that to you who are doing non-credit. Bob, if I could piggyback off that with another idea, knowing that we are working towards that has forced us to rethink how do we do, how do we define transition and non-credit we def, we oh it's a transition course to credit it's a transition to this but that's another question for the um for that curriculum development piece are we looking at the entry expectations for student skills and making that our student outcomes at a non-credit level so that's going to prompt us to have some different and hopefully better conversations with our sister colleges within the district. Yeah, the use of non-credit as uh, gateways ramps to credit programs and even offering some uh, credit for prior learning for those uh, into a credit program uh, both offers an opportunity and complicate, complicates this matter for us. But uh, thank you, Janet, for noting that. Uh, Bob and Sarah, I mean, Janet, Sarah had a question. This leads to my question about courses that are not a GE or a part of a degree or certificate. We have a small number of courses that are outside of this criteria that are part of our FYE program, which I'm not sure what that is. First year. Uh, first, built in first, first year experience. Mm -hmm. Guided pathways. Is anyone badging courses under this condition? We used guided pathway funds to um, pay for our initial pilot. 
Eileen, are those courses badged though? No. So we just needed to get faculty. We're just starting. So we used it to pay for faculty to take the course, get trained, and then to actually start our committee process for reviewing. So at CCC and well, in our district, actually, we have courses that are designed to support students in choosing a major. And the plan is to also contextualize them as well. Um, so as students are entering a pathway, but they're still unsure which major to go into, um, it's being it's a one of the, I guess, required courses at Contra Costa that students take if they're undecided to help them choose a major and move more efficiently towards their goals. Um, and I know that there are other community colleges across the state that do offer these career and major exploration courses and varying ways but i just was wondering if you know that was something that other co other colleges because they're not they're not um they are uc transferable csu transferable so the units are transferable but they don't fall into um a general education pattern um specifically but students are being moved into them if especially if they're undecided so i didn't know if that was sort of a pattern that's happening at other community colleges across the state with guided pathways and fye with this work plans and um if anybody was considering those courses the other one that is um common as well at contra costa is a library studies course it's like a research-based course to help students and so it's a common one unit course for a student who perhaps has 11 units in their first semester and they need a little extra, you know, they need to get to that 12, but it provides them with that really solid foundation in their first year of college and doing conducting um, research that they need in all of their courses through their college career. So they just, those are just two examples of courses at CCC that don't fit into any of the badging criteria, but I was wondering if anybody had any creative ways that we could move forward with them because we have faculty that teach them that are ready and have other courses badged and would like to get them badged as well. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for sharing that. All right, Janet, thank you so much for your presentation. It was so informative and just seeing, you know, the course design from that perspective it really does make sense. It really, you, you know, it, I think we all think of it in that perspective, but, but not like, you know, but not really. So thank you for bringing that to light and thank you for bringing uh, your ideas and sharing them with us. Um, I think that's going to be really helpful to a whole lot of us um, as we move forward with uh, all the work that we are continuously doing. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. All right, everyone. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to um, our IDs, Sean and Cheryl. They are going to go ahead and present us with some of our some norming topics. Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started here with C5 from the rubric. Um, Oh, let me also say that, you know, it's it's been great working with all of you that I've worked with and getting certified. I mean, it's just amazing to see uh, all the progress that uh, that has been made across the system. So it's exciting. So um, C5 has come up. It's on the rubrics uh, a couple of times recently. And I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity to just take a look at it. And um, technically, as you see here, uh, aligning to C5 is uh, that either rubrics or descriptive and or descriptive criteria for the desired outcomes are included. So the question had come up, you know, does most or all assessments have to actually have a rubric that uses the canvas tool well it doesn't right but uh, you know it does have to have the descriptive criteria and I started thinking about it a little bit talking with my team about it and um, it, it really is an opportunity because when you're going through reviews really the goal is um, 
Okay, let's see what you got and let's see what we can do to help you move forward and even take it to the next level. So I just wanted to show uh, the, the thought I had, let me say that, the thought that I had was how you develop your rubrics really then takes you back to how your grading uh, schematic is um, in the first place. And uh, there's not necessarily, uh, or let me say, C5 seems to be the closest thing that the rubric, rubric actually connects you to how you're setting up your grading. So I just wanted to show uh, quickly a couple of examples. Um, and in this case, I have this concert report that uh, I have the rubric set up uh, using the Canvas rubric tool. And as you can see, 12 points for this writing assignment. Well, that in and of itself, you know, fine. I mean, I'm looking at uh, each of the criteria. I try to have it where uh, students can see, okay, do I have that element? Am I meeting that criteria? Um, but in the bigger picture, right, how does that fit into all of the grading for the course in general? So the, and this is where you can work with instructors to say, okay, well, let's see where you're at with C5. Uh, what does your grading schematic look like? And the total for the course, this, this is uh, like after several iterations of developing this course over years, uh, I got it to where the course is just simply worth 100 points. And before I was using, you know, weighted and, uh, you know, some assignments would be based on percentages or whatnot. And myself being challenged by someone that was working with me to develop my course, I realized that it makes the value of every point on every uh, activity, which takes you down to every point on every rubric to have that much more value to it. So that concert report is 12, which is 12 full points out of the total 100 that you earn for the class. So, um, so with going back and rethinking okay, how am I really grading this course? I ended up really simplifying. And I think many of you would agree that a lot of times when working with mentoring instructors going through the review process, simplifying is nine out of 10 times actually a positive, right? And it just made everything a lot clearer so that by the time students get to where they see the rubric, um they understand what these points are actually worth right so just wanted to show another uh example like in a discussion you know there's five discussions in the course and it's simply worth three points one per you know just going in and just giving basic criteria and um just another um point to note is that because they don't necessarily see the rubric, uh, I just created this table, just a basic table, um, you know, that go ahead, that aligns with what you see um, in the actual rubric itself, right? So just another uh, trick. And it's also something that shows that this is possibly a, a good way to show grading criteria if for any reason, uh, an instructor wasn't using the rubric. Of course, we all think everyone should use the rubric on every assignment, but um, so, yeah. And then I already pretty much showed that. Uh, so you can see that um, each activity is divided up. And this is where, you know, instructors can also take time to really think about uh, how items are weighted. Uh, I also like the idea, you know, when I when I was looking more into competency-based education, CBE, uh, I, I really liked how everything is tied to 
a specific learning object, right? And it's like, how can, you know, I move any courses that I'm involved in to look more like that? So just really just gleaning from uh, the best of that concept in general. So that's it, short and sweet. And just a few thoughts uh, on C5 and rubrics. John, another reason this topic came up today was a recent uh, poker capstone experience with a college getting certified. An English composition, a freshman comp instructor was bringing her course through and um, you had noted that uh, she might align better forget if she just didn't have a rubric for a writing assignment or it was vague. So your feedback was to uh, spend more time on the criteria and the levels of standards and, you know, in other words, improve the rubric. And her response was any way she tried to cut it, students could, there's a way students could get a passing grade using the rubric she could envision. And, and yet she didn't feel they were, should earn, earn, they didn't earn that passing grade. So my question would be to the group here, are any of you um, English teachers that have aligned your course and would you be willing to share your rubrics for your typical paper written assignments with each other? Uh, maybe this is something we could facilitate. Is, is there an interest in that? Piper? I, I just wanted to say that having taken the at one equitable grading strategies course, I now um, work with my students to create the rubrics that they believe will represent the skills that they want to develop um, in each English composition with, you know, with my guidance. But so every every class session, one of our tasks is building that rubric that represents the compositional skills and the critical thinking skills that they want to develop over the course. There are some sharers in the group. They want to share their rubrics. So maybe we can come up with a um, naming convention in commons so it's easier to find. Oh, Helen, you're hilarious. That's so funny. Try it. I want to see it. I've been asking. Wait a minute. That's not a. That's not a bad idea. It's not, and in fact, well, I'll report back if we have another norming meeting at some point. But there may be a um, inroad into captioning using ChatGPT. Wow. Whoa. I just wanted to point out. Somebody asked, uh, "What a rubric." without points have solved the issue? Suzanne asked. What do the experts say about that? And I think she means in the case of that English class. Right, right. We need more graduates of the equitable grading course. Mm -hmm. Oh, Pete wants you to just find the issue again. Yeah, and, and Sean, you'll have to help me. You, you were more directly involved, but this particular faculty member, an English professor in freshman composition course, um, found it difficult to create rubrics that could properly delineate all the criteria and the levels of standards that, that would properly uh, help the student both know what they're going to get uh, evaluated on and allow her to grade in a way that um, that she was grading before. So her problem was that some students with any way she could think of a rubric could get a passing grade on a paper that she didn't feel was passing. Right. And, you know, I think really the solution to it, um, you know, if, if you can whittle it down to um, maybe not a single solution, but uh, a, an approach to it is the more you can identify what elements as an instructor, right? As the SME, 
um, what elements really needs to be in the finished product, the deliverable. And when you can identify those elements and make that universal across the board, it, it puts a little bit of, uh, you know, you got to take some effort to do that. And really think about even at, even after you've taught it a few semesters, okay, I'm not really seeing what I'm expecting. So where's the miscommunication? You know, I mean, it, it's almost like the rubric is a communication tool in any course. So you know, how many points is it? Is it uh, you know criteria that's not based on points? Either way. It's really about how you're communicating and breaking it down. I saw somebody said in the chat, um, you know, uh, the rubric I was I was showing seems to be uh, more of a yes, no. And for me, it just seemed to be that the more I could uh, get it to that, is it there, is it not there, uh, the clearer it would be for students. And I think that uh, that makes it simpler for them so that when, and, it, and this was a writing assignment, right? A, a report uh, that they'll say, okay, I need to address the details of the concert I attended. I need to address um, the performance itself and what I observed visually, audibly. And when you give them that piece, then it kind of opens them up to, to think about, okay, how am I gonna communicate this? Because I think a lot of times, even with writing assignments, it's that, you know, we want to look for, we want to see the quality of communication. You know, another piece I'll put in there is, is it clear and uh, concise? You know, just use language to sort of uh, help students uh, see, oh, okay, um, read it back. That actually doesn't really seem to be very clear. Is there a way I can clarify that? Now that makes it one item that's worth one point. And then let me also say that it, it's a powerful thing to say, um, you know, it's, it's only worth one point. And then maybe if you didn't get that because it's just not clearly written, you're only like losing that one point that you could go and do your, um, your rewrite and then just come back and say, oh, let me just go in and clarify to get that point back. You know, so it makes it more of a positive experience that I think uh, aligns with um, more of the equitable grading um, uh, principles. So, And this conversation kind of goes back to uh, Janet's presentation, because she also taught in, in that um, document that she shared with us, she talked about, you know, looking at uh, what the objective is, you know, to building the assignment, to building the rubric criteria, or at least thinking about that. Like, what do we want the students to, um, what, what, what do we want the outcome of the assignment to be? And that's basically what the rubric is. Like, what are we expecting? And that's a really clear outline for the student to understand the expectations. Yeah, yeah, it, it is holistic. Uh, I see that. And to bring it back around to the review part, I just put the link into the famous course where it gives the reviewers the tips and where to look for it. So when we're talking about whether it's descriptive criteria or an actual rubric, we don't go much further than that, right? We don't talk about you should remove full marks, no marks, or you know, you should put more description in. And even the tool using the tool, a lot of um, instructors will just paste it in the first top where that should be like satisfactory, right? And then the description. So sometimes those pointers help them to clarify their rubric for the students as well. But when you're reviewing, have you had any conversations about, well, there are no rubrics in this course, but there's descriptive criteria. And if there is, is it only in the syllabus? Is it on every assignment. So has anybody had any of those conversations lately? Okay then, moving on. 
Do you like rubrics? Raise your hand. I love them. <laughs> I love them. <clears throat> well, I think also we were talking about this the other day about in the preparation um, for faculty when they're developing their courses. That's an important item to start off with. And how a rubric can not only help, but also, like you all said, inform the, the, the student. And in many of my courses that I teach, it's very specific criteria that's measurable. It's not, you know, not clear or concise. Those words aren't usually in it. It's more percentages, you know, eight out of 10, whatever, but actual skills. So there's a, a full gamut. Sarah has a question. I'm sorry, I was raising my hand to tell you that I liked rubrics, um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to just also add because we debated we've debated this in our district that, you know, I, our interpretation and what we've normed in this space is that rubrics are not required, but they certainly do provide we I think many of us can agree they make things really nice to grade and they make obviously the expectations very clear for students and Sean your suggestions to keep it simple are just helpful across the board. So I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the rubrics, but I have worked with some faculty who are, for some assignments, they don't prefer to use the rubric. And, um, you know, it's led to some debate, whereas we have said in our, through, you know, conversations here, and then back in our campus, you know, best practice is to use rubrics. And then sometimes that's interpreted by a reviewer as that's really the only way for alignment. So I just want to also, as much as I'm a fan, put out that they're not required. And sometimes we can get into the weeds if we're really saying, oh, you don't have rubrics, whereas this, whatever the assignment is, and Cheryl, you were just talking about if it's not specific criteria that you're grading, that perhaps a rubric isn't always, um, you know, the instructor might not choose that. And that's really still their purview um, as the faculty member to do that. Has to be some descriptive criteria, right? Or how yes. that you know complete complete. What's it going to be? What criteria are you going by? Exactly. Right. Right. And somebody mentioned also in the chat um, about tying it to A seven. So then there's there's another way you could. Um, that was uh, Meg uh, talking about you know the um, using the tools to your advantage, right? Because it just those tools are really just to make it easier for the instructor, so. And if I can just add, a few of you mentioned this, I think professional development in rubrics, I think we can all agree with that. And then um, Helen mentioned using ChatGPT, which George just used, I think, while we were talking about this <laughs> and shared with us, uh, because wording on rubrics, like, what do I write? Like, what descriptive language do I use? So, you know, uh, if we have professional development, the use of chat GBT and then taking what, you know, and, and building it into what we need would be really helpful. Um, but I think it sounds like we, we mostly agree that rubrics are a good thing and having that descriptive language, you know, so that our students understand what the criteria and expectations are is very helpful. And to be honest, as reviewers, doesn't it just make our life easier to see that rubrics are used and be like, hey, check, go on to the next item. <laughs> um, all right, Cheryl, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Now we're just gonna slide into C8. So let me put that in the chat for us so we can look at it. Again, if you take the information on these pages that we're sharing as, your starting point, the teams that I've been working with, the first meeting we have, it's so nice to go back to that page and just be all on the same page, really. And look at the rubric, look at the language as it states it, and then you can go, you know, left or right. But with this one, there are three, four other pages after this, but it it always comes up about several. And maybe we're we're so good at it now, we don't have to keep discussing it, but we the teams are having some struggles with it and the tips and exam. I should share my screen. Hold on. Um, so we just want to open that up a little bit to any local conversations that you've been having for this particular um, item. And again, when you see all the pages, let me get this out of the way here. When you see the pages, 
um, you know, there's tips and examples for the view reviewers. Plug, plug, bite-sized canvas is there too, Helen. Um, the examples. So if you start with the examples with the, the faculty in the beginning, it always is clearer to them. This one has the, the quizzes. The next one is the essay assignment for self-assessment. And of, this is for new people. And then the last one is the topic and short answers. So have any of you been having those conversations about C8 and what it's supposed to be? Let me pull my chat back up. Oh, we're still on rubrics. Wow, this is a very astute group. Oh, Sarah? Oh, that's an assignment. Sylvia, one. it's Sylvia. No, uh, no. I mean, oh, Sylvia has her hand up. My BFF down there, coastline. I just had a conversation with someone yesterday and they were saying, my class is already so full and I have already all these things for them to do. And it would just be so hard to add some more. So I responded to her, but I would like to hear what other people would have, what they would say to faculty who mentions this. And Kathleen says that some of the reviewers are mixing it up with anonymous feedback. Repeat what? Repeat that. Uh, you so have think... with... Sorry. Cheryl, are you asking whether self-assessment is, people are including self-assessment? Sylvia, is that what you were, your person was yes, saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Of, you know, faculty will say, okay, I already have assessments that are required, that are graded. Yeah, I have the anonymous survey, but now you want me to add more? You want me to add, you know, three more assessments? And, you know, we've talked about incorporating in what you already have, but I just wondered if people had certain strategies. They need to go watch the bite size on the value of self-assessment. Mm -hmm. Janet? We discovered that uh, a lot of our courses and this recent conversation with one of our poker reviewers, truly engaged instructor, and she realized that we were creating kitchen sink courses, which I've been using to describe the courses where you think, oh, but my students might need, and they might need this. And so you throw in everything, including the kitchen sink. But when we really stopped and looked at what are the outcomes, what are the assessments, is the course truly aligned? She got rid of a lot of stuff. And then suddenly there was room for all these other things. So it may not be a one more, it may be, do you need the sink conversation? Kathleen. Yeah, I, I think I've had this issue with a lot of my faculty as well. And I tell them the easiest way to align is to add one of the questions that is in the course design resources and add it to the end of a quiz. It's the easiest. And it's a very kind of intimate question to end a quiz with. You know, how are you, um, how are you managing your time so far this semester? And it just, I think it wakes the students up. Like, this teacher's paying attention to me. So mm -hmm. to me, that's the easiest way for faculty who are really saying it's just too much more to add. So that's, that's how I'm solving the issue. Very, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Both review, both skills-based, okay. And I've seen this come up just working with uh, some of you through the capstone. Uh, you know, what really um, satisfies C8? Is it more of a reflective kind of, you know, um, activity? Is it, can it be something that is dealing directly with the course content that someone can just check their understanding of whatever topics? Maybe it's like a, self-grading quiz that has feedback built into it and i'm just curious if, if everyone uh, here or if some of you feel like well it has to be it has to have that reflective element or if a course just happens to have more just working with the content directly 
or has to have both. I'm just curious if if, if that's come up with uh, with some of you. Lynn? I, I've also found that, especially during the pandemic, uh, the, during the height of the pandemic, that this was really useful for bringing up mental health issues for students. Uh, we had a psych professor who had a really great question that I ended up copying um, from my class, which was asking students where they were and you know, how they were doing. How are you doing uh, in your life? Uh, uh, and a Likert scale question. I'm great all the way to I am not doing well at all. And then in response to that, it was an anonymous survey I said, hey, some of you said you were struggling. Here are all the mental health resources that are available to you uh, through the campus. They're free and really getting a discussion going with the students about that. And I got so many responses from students uh, how appreciative they were that I had bothered to ask how they were doing. And so th this is an opportunity, I think C8 is an opportunity for you to ask those types of questions that have to do with how well they're performing in class is often tied to other issues that they're experiencing, especially our student populations. So uh, it, when students push, when faculty push back on it, I said, hey, this is the place where you can ask those other kinds of questions. Mm. Sylvia asked about counselors in the group and Sarah's a counselor. What did you say? Perhaps they have some other suggested questions similar to Lynn. I think that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I gave it a big heart when you were chatting, Lynn. <laughs> um, I was also going to add, I, you know, I, we never know our students, right? Um, but I have found that um, it doesn't always have to be anonymous. This, the students, it, when, when anybody reaches out and says, are you okay? Um, and the way that I've been doing that through my courses is also just looking at the grade book. <clears throat> and when I see a student goes missing for usually more than a week, um, I, that's my reach out, you know, more than a week and they haven't notified me they were gonna be missing class. Um, I will reach out and I don't start with, you are missing this assignment or whatever, I start with, I notice you haven't been in the class. Is everything okay? Um, and that's usually when this I will get the direct no. Everything is not okay. But I love the way that you know with that quiz doing that, then reiterating all of the campus resources, mental health resources, wellness resources that your campus offers, um, the hope hotline. All of that is just so incredible. So thanks for bringing that up. But I think that's a great strategy. Um, so from student services all of that and more, please. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else for C8? All right, well, then we're gonna move on to some accessibility, open-ended, not a choo-choo train or anything, but let's see if we can, um, bring up maybe two topics that you are struggling with in section D. And if the person is a reviewer doing A through D or a separate accessibility person looking over the course. And then of course we do recommend that somebody does the quality assurance at the very end, and make sure all the fixes were, or the edits were done. Oh, Janet is sharing, how are you doing simple or survey sample? Suzanne, for sure. Janet has a separate person. There has to be an accessibility question out there. Are y'all just tired? Oh, Moses came on. You got one? Yep. There you go. Yeah, I sure do. Um, so this is tied to long in image descriptions and uh, assessment in courses like, for instance, uh, we've got a, a geology course that we're getting through the process currently. Uh, and this has been like a little bit of a sticky wicket. So obviously with these types of images in content presentation, you know, in instruction, 
Um, they need to, to have a long description, you know, in body text, attached by link, et cetera, and, and you know, standard. Um, but it gets a little weird with assessment. And I was wondering if folks have uh, perspectives on, on this issue because, you know, this is, it's kind of the classic problem of um, if you have an adequate long description available, say in a quiz, um, then you might be handing the assignment to any student, who, uh, the, the uh, answer to any student who accesses it, right? So I just wanted um, to, to get some feedback on how people handle this. Um, we've, we've had some thoughts, but I'd love to hear from the kind of collective knowledge well. Suzanne? And this may just be one solution based on my particular class, but I teach biology, right? And the, and the classic image I had that was an issue was the stages of mitosis. Mm -hmm. So if my description said, you know, metaphase, then yeah, I'm giving it away. My descriptions are more actually descriptive. So it would say um, a cell with X's lined up in the center, right? Mm -hmm. So students have to know what that means to be able to answer the question. So to describe, know. yeah, yeah, I mean the actual drawing. And I'm sensing from Moses's look that that does not help the geology person. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, this faculty member has um, some instances with like, uh, I think some of them are multiple response to the same prompt. Um, and it's a pretty sophisticated diagram of, uh, you know, of, of a geological formation with different stuff going on, right? Um, and, you know, in the instructional setting, it would just be a full long description text of, of what that was. So, I mean, maybe that informs it a little bit and I can take that back to her, but I'm definitely looking for something that's a, a general approach. Um, and I mean, the answer might be that for some of these sorts of things, um, in order for it to be fair assessment, uh, that that really that these are the instances where you actually need need human support, right? Um, where where you actually need you know for us our uh, our high tech center at the at our special resource center to to be available to work with students for that assessment. Um, but I don't know. I'm just kind of fishing around to see what what other approaches there are. And um, you know, I, Suzanne, I think that that's uh, it's a good pointer. And I think it's some that type of approach will probably apply for a lot of instances that I can point my faculty to, but not for all of them. Um, I have a comment. I'm, I'm curious, because I've used this in the past as a solution uh, where you have this complex image that requires a lot of text. Well, just the page that it's in, you know, if that description is actually written in the page just as a body of text there's no limit to that and something in just the image uh you know is, is just a very basic um description but then it's understood or you can make it understood that the body of the text in the page is really what's describing what's going on in the image that seems to me like that might be a more general um approach solution uh, when you do run into that and it helps all learners as somebody said to um other than english and by the way dave posted a lovely site that you might want to take a look at for describing images but then again moses you said it was in a quiz so it's different than yeah exactly you know that's totally sean that's totally the approach that we're I, i'm trying primarily pushing that approach rather than having a separate link long description it's just better instructionally for sure to actually, you know, what, what's this image doing on this page, right? Um, and that's kind of the classic when somebody's like just coming into poker and they kind of think they know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, the context that we're looking at is, as uh, my colleague Ria is pointing out, is it is, it's in a, in a quiz or a test, it's, a, it's in an assessment setting where having that depth of explanation and being able to, I don't know my geographic vocabulary, so I can't, I, I can't pull any of this up off the top of my head, but to say like, oh, and there's this whatever fault line along this something or another, right? Like that would literally be giving the answer through that description. And so it's like, we need another way around that. Yeah, like a like an art appreciation course that I was working with somebody on that the question was, and it was a starry night and it's, you know, you have to actually visually look at the image and, you know, answer questions 
based on it. But, but believe it or not, we put our heads together and figured something out because then it's like, okay, well, what really are you assessing? You know, you could really whittle it down and narrow it down um, to say, well, I can give you this much of a text description of an actual image because what I'm really looking for is I'm assessing how you're looking for this, you know? So um, I guess just to say it, anything's possible. That's actually, yeah, that's a really good guideline, I think, for thinking about this kind of problem is to say, hey, say that you've already done the work, the good work in your instructional presentation of talking through, uh, and hence you have transcript, or of describing on the, on the content page um, and giving a thorough description. Then like, what are the parts you would need to excise from that in your prompt? that is basically like, hey, what's the missing piece here, essentially? What am I looking for you to be able to identify? And I can give you the rest of the context. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, I suppose that, uh, I don't know, there might be some other challenges that spring, that come up in that, but it's at least another another good direction to, to think about it. I appreciate that. Suzanne? This discussion is actually reminding me of, um, so we recently had the Accessibility Center come do their capability maturity model uh, for us. And just random plug unrelated, um, super awesome if you get a chance to be on their list, so helpful. But one of the, the things they talked about is having an accessibility statement in your syllabus beyond just the, if you need help, go to DSP. And I, I think this may help for that kind of situation where the instructor could say up front, you know, here are the accessibility challenges. Um, come work with me ahead of time so we can have a plan. So putting that right in the syllabus ahead of time may, may solve some of those issues. And Maggie posted too about, um, you can use the HTML for screen reader only, but then that's another, you know, training opportunity for the faculty member or your helper, your mentor, but that should help. I say should, we hope. But then we get creative, you know, in, in assessments where we're trying to get more creative. Um, somebody asked about ASL too. I think Wendy did. Um, we had an ASL just come up recently with the Accessibility Center folks. And it was about, you know, the video itself. Well, actually the video doesn't have to have captions because it's, you're trying to find out what the, right? Um, but I will say that, oh, thank you for that, Bob. I will say though that the center now with their extra people, they're more people, they're just so helpful. There's like, everybody has their own expertise and um, it's been helping us a lot, you know, to be on the same page. So make sure you use them as much as you can. What else do we have in here? Okay, the diagram center, that's a good link, Wanda. Bob put in the maturity model. And then right before that, so she put in the accessibility toolbox that's on our resource site. All these good things. Um, what does Scott say here? Oh, okay. Tactile. Jessica, what school are you at? Type. I'm at, no, I can speak. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm at Southwest College. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Any other accessibility? Isn't it fun that we're here now and nobody's asking about captioning? It's just amazing. So we get, kind of got that down, Pat. But I wanted to, who said about um, chat GPT and captioning? Who said that? I can't remember. Helen. Helen. I have to test it. Okay but somebody had a video that didn't have any captions at all, a YouTube video that they were using. And so they couldn't correct the SRT file because there was no SRT file. So he asked ChatGPT to create an SRT file for him, which it did, but the timing is often stuff. So mm -hmm. I have to do a little research to find out if maybe his prompt wasn't correctly worded or so I don't want to get too many hopes up, but we may um, have help that just get a file that's not getting from Susan. elsewhere. Susan? Hi, everyone. Um, I was just curious if any of you have ever had to deal with a situation where 
you came across like a really severe accessibility issue um, within a course or an instructor that is not going through the review process. In other words, um, I don't know if it would be like out of um, my place, for example, or who I should bring it up with, because literally like while I'm in this uh, meeting, I'm getting these emails from our student help desk saying, you know, these students can't access their final because literally they're asked to download a static PDF document. They're asked to annotate over it or print it, fill it out, scan it back, convert to PDF, and then upload it. So not only do they have to have, you know, either an annotation tool or they have to have a printer, scanner, and a PDF converter in order to complete their final. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these poor students, you know, and I'm just curious if anyone's ever had to or have come across a situation where maybe it's instructors that are outside the review process that might have issues and right. maybe how to it go about. It shouldn't matter. All instructors yeah. are for accessibility, whether they're right, going right. or not. So then the support could be local or the accessibility center could help too, maybe. Or just yeah. destroy PDFs, just destroy them. <laughs> And it's not even a fillable one. It's literally a flat. Right, one. right, right. And then there's another issue there. Because it's a sensitive topic too, right? To, um, because I'm finding out, you know, behind the scenes, I wouldn't have known about it. And Correct. But it's coming from the student. Right. And we know what happens when that happens. Not always good. Who's next here? George? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, so OpenAI, which was the organization that created GBT, had a different project called Whisper, which is their um, automatic uh, speech recognition model. And it works very, very well. And they actually made it open source. So there are a number of Whisper-based tools that you can download. And I've been for years using um, Otter, which was a commercial product that does the same thing. But I've switched to using Whisper because it's free. It works Ooh. just as well or better. Um, I haven't used it to generate SRT directly, but what I'll do is use Whisper to um, transcribe, uh, you know, the audio on a video, and then I'll just upload it to the to the text um, as plain text in YouTube, and it'll YouTube will do its little magic of aligning the timings for me, and then I can get an SRT if I need one there. But I found it's uh, faster and um, Free. <laughs> Otter's only fifty dollars a year, and it works really well too. So oh, the first day I, that we signed up for Monday.com. So that that's it. Just and and if you're asking ChatGPT to do something, it's probably using Whisper anyway. So sorry about that. Don't click on that link if your volume is on. Okay, it's just going to play this the ad. Bethany. Hi, everybody. Uh, just actioning to Cadio has a capture. You run your YouTube video in for it in studio, and then studio will caption it as well. So now you have the recording in studio, you have an SRT file in studio, and studio will then also allow you to download them onto your own hard drives if you want to keep a backup copy of them in case we would ever lose studio or something like that. Can you just repeat the beginning of that? You were kind of... Okay, sorry about that. Um, whenever you have a YouTube video that doesn't, any video that doesn't have... Um, captions. Now, streaming services like Hulu um, or Prime will not allow you to do this. So it has to be like a YouTube kind of thing. But you can pull up the YouTube video in a window. And at the same time, you've got it in, in a second tab or something, you've got Canvas Studio running. And in Studio, there is a, a feature called Screen Capture. And you can start it recording and then play your YouTube video and studio will record whatever is playing on your screen and right. it will even allow you like if you get a little junk on the beginning of it or a little junk on the end of it it will even allow you to edit that out before you save it into studio and then you can request that studio does the captioning edit your captions in studio 
as well. And then you've got the video and the captions in studio. You can then put them in C3 three media if you want, or is my ultimate backup plan with a lot of my videos and SRT files is just to download them onto a hard drive, an external hard drive. And you can do that in um, Canvas and studio. But what about copyright if you don't own that video in YouTube? That, that is, that's always an issue. You know, some of these videos that are being put up are already in copyright infringement. So I just kind of um, look at who it is that's putting it up mm -hmm. and hope for, hope for the best. <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it's sad because there are some of these videos out there that are older videos that we, we can't get any other way. And yet the material is something that is important that we have. Um, so I kind of, I don't think I have any that are an issue right now, but if it were me, considering what I am using it for, I'd probably play the gamble odds on it and just go for it. You know, if somebody wants to bust me for copyright infringement when I'm providing it to, as a, as a uh, open education resource that for, for students who have uh, economic issues, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll take the slap on the hand. <laughs> well, you know, and at least what, what Helen says, if you make due diligence of, you know, trying to contact them or, mm -hmm. or giving credit, full credit. Yes, and, and that's something that I do in my videos. Anytime I post something up into my classrooms, I'll always put, you know, the title of it and who it was generated by because students would need that information anyway if they were going to be quoting from it. And the same thing with the YouTube videos. So in, in my situation, I because uh, I teach his, history, I generally try to provide whatever information a student would need to build an APA formatted uh, citation. And that way they still have to figure out how to put it all in the right order and which information they need. But I try to put all that information out there and that way the source is also getting the credit that they're due. Exactly. Workarounds, I see a bunch of them besides down sub and then why to meet, there's another one. We'll have to capture all these from the, from the chat. <laughs> what can't you do, I missed what this is referring to. I think I, that was about accessibility, finding a course with accessibility problems. What do you do? Because of our union, I can't. Okay. It's, it's going by really quickly. Tool. Yes, we started with Amara, George, and then we, we got, it was just a little harder. Okay, am I missing anything in here? Lots of resources. Cheryl, this is Wanda. Hi, Wanda. Um, I posted a link to a YouTube tutorial where I also learned how to use Whisper. Oh. Um, and it provided, it was amazing. It, it provided um, an SRT file, a VTT file, text for um, a transcript to the video. Um, it, it was actually not difficult to use at all. There's some initial setup, but wow. it was amazing um, experience to use. Could you post that again, Wanda? I think it's so far back in chat now, we can't find it. Okay. I feel a webinar coming on in the future. Well, somebody's future. Let's see what's at the bottom now. Oh, that's what Wendy was talking about, not being able to say anything if you see something in a course. Yeah, you know, one of the hard things about being Canvas admin is you see a lot of stuff that you can't do anything about because unless the instructor is up for evaluation. So we really have to hope that like I guide the students and what to do and what to, you know, who to contact. But our role is we can't be, you know, our role is we're faculty, fellow, you know, some DE coordinators are not faculty and some are. I'm fellow faculty. So my, and I don't want people to suddenly say, I don't want you ever in my class. So I can give like a helpful hint. Like I'll say, like, hey, I noticed this is going on in your class. Can I help you with 
this. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so I can kind of like, but the only reason why I would have been in their class is because a student had a question or the instructor had a class question, but they were, otherwise I wouldn't be going in their classes. Sylvia, can you relate? <laughs> yeah, what I do, especially if a student has a contact at our help desk, is I will, you know, tell the student, you know, kind of help them, but then I will send a separate email, not in our ticket system to the faculty member and say, hey, a student or some students from your course have been contacting the help desk, reporting such and such. We've done our best to, you know, give them, you know, help them out. But, you know, and then you might say something just like Wendy was saying, hey, you know, you might get less uh, issues from students if you set it up a different way. Here's a suggestion. Teaching moment. All right. We have seven minutes to wrap up. So she. We do. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for the great conversation and for the sharing of all of those resources. Uh, Let me just go ahead and share my screen one last time for the last slide. Um, Let's see. All right, everyone. So um, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, there is no new news about what's going to happen in the future, but we do have some tips for you all. Um, about, you know, moving forward with local poker. Um, And uh, Cheryl and Sean came up with these. So I have to credit them for for these uh, wonderful words of wisdom. Um, So we encourage you to continue to hold local local norming sessions with your team. Um, the, The hope is one a month. Um, so try, you know, we're, we, we all talked about professional development a lot today. And as we know, you know, uh, that, that that is what keeps us um, current with all of these practices. Uh, four to five faculty preparation. If I've learned anything in this role in these past few months is that the way we prepare our faculty to build these online courses, that really is the key to success. So um, make sure you're looking at uh, the our rubric, the uh, CVC OEI rubric, um, and that you're integrating those rubric items into your faculty preparation, and also looking at the course design elements um, and the rubric as well. Uh, there are a lot of adoptable courses um, in Commons, including OTD, which you can adopt. Um, I know a lot of you guys count on OTD. Um, So take a look at that adoptable course. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the the chancellor's office as well as CVC is committed to um, OTD and GRID is the online teaching and design course. Um, That's the 12 week course that a lot of um, colleges or instructors take or use to um, get um, all of the know-how of how to build a course. It's course design, basically. Um, But anyway, uh, um, you know, hopefully this isn't um, our last uh, norming session. Um, But um, like I said, there's no no, uh, further news. Uh, but we do know that uh, of the commitment that uh, CVC and the Chancellor's Office um, have of continuing the work, and I'm going to stop sharing so we can all see each other. Um, I personally want to thank Sean, Cheryl, and Helen. I know all of you. I, I, I'm, I'm such a bad host. I didn't even tr- introduce myself. Um, my name is Sochil Tirado. I'm a DE coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Um, so I have uh, been working with Sean, Cheryl, and Helen for a, a few months, but for many, many years, just like all of you have. And um, we know how much they have helped us along this journey. Um, we know how important the lessons that they have taught us are, and we've taken those lessons back to our campus. We've created our own uh, review processes, 
And, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to see so many different colleges and so many different ways of reviewing courses, and they're all so wonderful, Sean, Cheryl, and Helen, and it's it's because of you guys. Uh, you know, I think I can say that with confidence. Uh, you know, I think we all feel this that are in this group. We want to, I want to thank you. And, you know, I, I'm sure everybody, um, you know, feels the same. You have been so important. And as Cheryl says, Cheryl always tells me, you're not getting rid of me. And um, <laughs> I, I hope she means that because I, I think we'll, we'll all be, you know, still looking for them and looking for their advice and their guidance. So, um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it to you guys, Cheryl, Sean. Like sending your kids off to college, you're all doing so well. Just continue the good work. And it is satisfying to hear the stories from the colleges when it sounds like they've incorporated, you know, the system that at one had in place. So that's really good. So those at OTC, we'll see you there. Five o'clock every day at the Renaissance. See you then. Sean, would you like to say anything? Well, yeah. uh, again, it's just been a pleasure working with all of you that I've worked with and, um, I know uh, you all are going to kill it uh, locally and just keep moving forward. Um, what else to say? We'll still be in touch one way or another. So, um, yeah. All right, Bob. Yeah, uh, thanks. I really appreciate you saying that, Sochi. I was going to break in to do the same. Um, couldn't have done it without our three, now two IDs. and and uh, But... They're not leaving the system. They'll they'll be part of this probably from their colleges, respective colleges. So, um, but thank you for setting us up for success. We now have close to half the 116 colleges, uh, very either already certified or close to certified. So it is really making a dent now as we are scaling this up as which was our goal for local poker. Uh, so thank you all for your work and the work of the IDs and that. Um, have uh, a great summer break and I will be at OTC as well. We look forward to seeing you all. Um, any last words from anyone else? All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great summer.